I'm so glad to be able to be here in these days. And I'm going to bring you away from the sea and from the subjects and issues connected to the sea. I'm going to bring you to Switzerland, far away from the sea, but there are mountains, there are lakes, there are roads. So Switzerland is on the crossroad of many European and the world uh, transport routes. So transport is uh, a developed, very well developed uh, um, industry uh, in Switzerland and the regulation is, um, well, we shall see. <laughs> um, the liability and the transport of goods is governed by the Swiss Code of Obligations. So as an introduction, I have to say a few words about the code itself and uh, about the way it uh, governs the questions of liability for goods. Uh, we shall talk about the levels of fault in Swiss law. And then we come to the major point, and that is the question of liability or limitation of liability of the carrier in cases of gross negligence. I must say that I was convinced the whole my professional life in one solution, and I was dealing with claims convinced that I do everything very well until at the end of my career, I discovered that there are different opinions and things that I was so sure in are not so sure anymore. So we shall see the question of equating gross negligence with, with willful misconduct. I guess the CMR convention may be familiar to some of you for the cross-border transportation of goods by road. Then we shall see, of course, the carrier's liability is normally insured. What consequences do these uncertainties and questions have on the insurance of the carrier's liability? And a glance to the future, as far as it is possible, we shall see. So the code of obligations and the way the code governs the liability of the carrier for loss of and damage to the goods and the delay in delivery. The first version of the code of obligations was adopted in 1881. And this code was revised already in 1911. And this one century, more than one century that passed in the meantime, Several parts of the code have been revised, but the provisions on the carriage of goods are almost, almost unchanged. So imagine more than 100 years old. Um, the code has a general part that governs contracts of any kind, and then a special part where it governs sales, contracts, uh, whatever, and also contracts of carriage of goods, not passengers, just, just goods. The contract of carriage is governed by Title 16. So you know that there are many international conventions for different unimodal uh, transport, international transport. There are also Swiss internal laws that govern certain unimodal transport. So whenever such an enactment, a law or a convention applies, the application of the code of obligation is only subsidiary. That it finds application for transport on inland waterway tra transport on Swiss waters not connecting connected to the sea, that means not on the river Rhine, transport by cable cars and also to multi-border transport, because transport is defined as carriage of goods for a fee from A to B. 
it doesn't say in the CEO that this has to be multimodal or whatever. So there is also a decision saying that the code of obligations applies also to multimodal transport. But in practice, where these provisions of Title 16 mostly apply, uh, that is the inland transport of goods by road. Uh, the law says that the carrier is liable to the goods entrusted to it. I would say to him, but I was taught that in English, carrier is an it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so there may be total loss or a partial delivery or a, a delayed delivery or partial damage that may happen to the goods and the carrier is uh, liable. Of course, if there is such a damage, that means that the contract of carriage was, there was a lack or inadequate performance and there must be a causal link between this uh, inadequate performance and uh, the damage itself. So let us see what the code of um, obligations say. Uh, it governs the uh, liability of the carrier in two articles, 447 and 448. In article 447, it says that the carrier is liable if goods are lost or destroyed. Lost that may be delivered to the wrong consign consignee, so that the right consignee has lost the goods, or the goods are totally damaged, constructed total loss or whatever. So in these cases, the carrier is, is uh, liable up to the full value of the goods. Of course, he can um, relieve itself from liability if he invokes some of these grounds for his uh, exemption of liability. And in this article 447, uh, paragraph three says that agreements between the carrier and its client on an amount of compensation lower than the full value are allowed. So that means that the liability up to the full value of the goods is not compulsory. If the parties agree in another way, either a higher liability or a lower liability, that is okay. Then article 448 governs the partial damage. That means uh, damage to the goods, uh, a partial loss, partial destruction or delay in delivery. So in these cases, it says subject to the same conditions and reservations same conditions, full value, same reservations, this here and this here. So the carrier is also liable for any partial damage. That means also in case of partial damage, um, if a lower amount of compensation is agreed with the uh, client that is also allowed. In any case, the damage may not exceed the damage for the total loss. What does that in fact mean? If a total loss of goods occurs, and if we know that the limitation of the carrier's liability is the value of the goods, so the total loss of the goods is the full value of the goods, so the physical damage will be compensated, but there is no financially any more space for any extra damage. But in case of a partial damage, uh, if let's say a machine is just partially damaged and uh, the machine is of, I don't know, 10,000, uh, the price is 10,000 and the uh, repairs cost only 1,000. So there are 9,000 9, uh, 
still a disposition for the consequential damage. Uh, if there is a cum cum uh, cumulation, so uh, the machine is damaged, but also arrives with a delay, then the, uh, the accumulation of these two types of compensation may not exceed the full value. So this, what I have said until now, is the situation when the damage to the goods is caused by normal negligence of the carrier. Nothing specially happened. He is liable for the damage, but according to these provisions 447 and 448. I will explain uh, shortly the types, the levels of fault as the Swiss law sees them. There is slight negligence, there is gross negligence, an even higher level is willful misconduct, and then there is unlawful intent. I would like just to hear shortly from you, from Croatia, from Italy, from Spain, uh, does your, do your laws see these levels of fault in the same way, or uh, are there any provisions that considerably deviate from this, um, this way? <coughs> No answer. Okay, maybe yeah, later. <laughs> In Croatian law, well, it's very simple. Yes. Yeah. But, but no, maybe maybe there would be a different yeah, level of how you understand the willful misconduct. Other is it uh, because the Croatian law we have intent? Is it the same as willful misconduct? We shall come to that right now. <laughs> um, so the Swiss Code of Obligation makes distinction between slight negligence, gross negligence, and unlawful intent. Uh, in case of non-performers or defective performance of any uh, contract, there is the presumption of the fault, but only of the lowest level of the fault. And the carrier we saw it in the article 447, if he proves uh, that damage was caused by elements that he can relieve uh, him from his liability, then he may reverse this presumption. If the shipper wants to prove a higher degree of negligence, he may try to do so, but then he has the burden of proving that. Uh, the shipper may not know about the details of transport, how it was carried out. So uh, the carrier has responsibility of submitting the facts of transport that they know to him, but not known to, to the shipper. Uh, the law itself does not define these degrees of negligence. It just names them, but doesn't give any definitions. But the court gave the definitions in, in several cases. So it is said that a person acts negligently if he or she does not provide the care to which he or she is obliged under the circumstances. And in order to, to uh, define that, to, to, uh, to see the matter, an objective test uh, is uh, adopted. So the comparison of the way a person acted with the, with, uh, the way a person or the, of the skill uh, in that profession uh, would have reacted. So a diligent carrier and a wrongdoer, uh, these two types uh, would be compared. So 
A fourth would be the failure of the wrongdoing party, in our case, the carrier, to do what a reasonable, a reasonable carrier would do in the same situation. Uh, if we talk about slight negligence, then the, this failure concerns not the most elementary, heavy precautionary measure, measures or rules, but nevertheless, this person ignored the degree of care that would be expected from him in the same circumstances. So uh, for such a case, for slight negligence, we may say, okay, it's not good, but that can happen. We, we can understand it. He did a mistake, but it's not so bad. And in transport, uh, a great percentage, I found somewhere 80%, I think even 90% of the number of claims are caused by slight negligence. And these are cases of uh, rather low claim amounts that are paid and settled and so on. So not so problematic. Uh, there are very few court decisions in the field of transportation. Uh, in one decision, the court was dealing with the case where a freight forwarder gave a, an order to a subcontractor and this subcontractor omitted to include the transit clause in the consignment note. He forgot. So the court says, okay, it may happen, it is a mistake, but it is not, uh, it is just a slight negligence, it is not gross negligence. I am not sure that nowadays the court would see the situation in the same way, but that was a few decades ago. And then there were several cases similar to each other where stowaways got into a trailer uh, in the trade, in the transport from uh, North Africa to Europe. And the court said, okay, the driver did not control the trailer after it was open for customs purposes, but he was not supposed to do so. So that is also only slight negligence and not gross negligence. That is what Swiss courts uh, the decisions of Swiss courts in such cases, uh, confirming only slight negligence. Gross negligence, on the other hand, uh, generally there are decisions with definitions of gross negligence, although the court are not very willing to, to confirm gross negligence. In the field of the carriage of goods, there are really not many court decisions at all and concerning gross negligence as well. But anyway, we may say that the court are of the opinion that gross negligence exists if a person violates a basic duty of care, which would be respected by a reasonable person in the same situation. So uh, that means that the most elementary precautionary measures are disregarded. So we cannot say, okay, it, it can happen. We would say, oh, that's a no-go. That shouldn't have happened. A carrier cannot act in this way. So no excuse. There are also, as I said, just a few court decisions confirming gross negligence. In a well-known case, it was a freight forwarder who got a package of gold watches and the consignor, the shipper, gave him the information that these are watches, gold watches. So uh, a valuable item, but the freight forwarder shipped those watches just as ordinary freight and not as valuable cargo. So the court held that 
the freight forwarder should have taken reasonable security measures, adequate security measures, and he did not do so, so he acted with gross negligence. Okay, I can see that in the same way. And it happened very, very often, especially uh, in uh, trade with uh, Italy, that the driver decides to, to stay overnight somewhere next to highway so that he doesn't have to drive a long way until the parked area that is um, under surveillance control and so on. So he just stays overnight where he seems that it is appropriate. And uh, so this one was uh, take, uh, uh, he spent the night somewhere in a freely accessible park place without any security measures on that parking place, without any security measures on the truck itself, because the alarm was not functioning. And uh, uh, it turned out that he, was, he didn't know how to deal with that anyway. And uh, the goods were stolen. So the court said maybe only one of these measures, they were not appropriate, would not be grossly negligent. But the whole carriage, the whole um, circumstances of this case with so many deficiencies, that was grossly negligent. Uh, as I said, the Swiss law talks about negligence, gross negligence, and intent or unlawful intent, but that is the same. The Swiss law does not know the notion of willful misconduct, but Swiss courts, or they had to deal with, with conventions or with uh, uh, damages that happened abroad, and so it is not a totally unknown notion. Willful misconduct is certainly a higher degree of negligence than gross negligence. Besides just negligence, uh, what is necessary is this knowledge that the damage would probably result. Not only that behavior was negligent, reckless, thoughtless or whatever, but the person who acted in this way was supposed to, to, knew, to, to knew, to see. And not to care. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's important. Exactly. Yeah. Should have known, but did still and act in this way. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So, mm -hmm. regardless of the awareness of this probability that the damage uh, would probably occur, the person acted and didn't care about the consequences. Unlawful intent can have, can mean two things. One thing is direct intent. So if somebody wants to make a damage, to cause damage, but in transport, that is not very often the case. The carrier does not want to damage the goods of its client. But sometimes he acts in a way that it is in fact a contingent intent. Uh, for example, if, uh, if a carrier takes over fragile goods, puts them on the on the truck and then put some heavy items on top of it. It's obviously that fragile goods will get uh, damaged. So this is, it was not its intention to, to break the glasses or whatever. So it was not a direct intent, but it was certainly a contingent intent and that is more or less equal to willful misconduct. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? You know about uh, it depends on the facts. 
and circumstances in the case. I mean, it's very difficult to define situations. Yeah. To, to kind of generalize. Yeah, but I think that this kind of behavior that we call contingent. Especially if that carrier is doing is is following goods of that sort from time to time on a regular basis. He knows what would happen. Yeah. He should know what would happen and should know what consequences that would be. I was I I took as a good of this product. Yeah. He's aware he doesn't care. Exactly. I think that willful misconduct and contingent intent yeah. are almost equal, are, the, are yeah. the same thing. So if I say that Swiss law knows the notion of unlawful intent, it in fact knows the notion of willful misconduct, just calls it Different. in another way. Uh, as you said, to determine for a damage with which degree of fault it was caused, it has to be, all, all details have to be examined on a case by case basis. And this lack of care has to be measured objectively compared to how would a reasonable carrier act in the same situation. And some subjective excusabilities. <laughs> For example, the driver was very tired or he had uh, family problems or, or, or whatever, that doesn't matter. Uh, I had to put this down as well. Uh, there is no rule that, for example, armed robbery would always be the same level of fault, cause with the same level. Uh, in previous years, when uh, somebody threats the driver with a pistol, with, uh, so there is an armed robbery, the carrier was automatically uh, relieved of his liability. Now it is not so anymore. Now it has to be examined. Did he choose the right route? Why was he there at that time? Uh, he should have known that driving in Naples in the night uh, is dangerous. Uh, did he have a uh, possibility to take another route to avoid that danger and so on? So uh, there is no rule that, for example, an armed robbery would always be an exemption from carrier solubility. He may be uh, liable, but you know, but to, to a limited carry. amount, or he may be even uh, liable for the whole uh, damage because he acted negligently or whatever. But of course, when we examine these possibilities uh, of uh, precaution, uh, uh, that financial practicability has also to be taken into account. It is not always possible to have two drivers or to drive the whole way around or, or so. So on a case by case basis, it has to be looked at it. Okay, that was the introduction. <laughs> no, <laughs> <it> is... <laughs> <laughs> Come to the point. So the question of liability for gross negligence, and as I said, I was surprised there are arguments in favor of unlimited liability. And I considered the, the, the unlimited liability just to be given before I took a look at those arguments. There are arguments in favor of limited liability and we shall see what happens in practice. So those who argue that the limitation of liability for gross negligence of carriers in Switzerland is limited, um, I wanted to say, why, why is that question important? 
at all. Why does it matter so much? Uh, you remember when I showed article 447 and 448? In 448, especially when there is um, uh, partial damage or even with the total loss, there may be consequential damages for which a carrier uh, may be made liable. Uh, this consequential damage may be much, much higher than the physical damage to the goods. So it is important to establish does the carrier, is he obliged to pay compensation higher than just the value of the goods or value of the goods and, and that's, that's it. Uh, arguments in favor of an unlimited liability are often found in a court decision that I already mentioned. A forwarder shipped a package of gold watches as ordinary freight. So the Federal Supreme Court, and these are clever guys, so when they say so, that must be so, they said, well, there is an Article 100, Paragraph 1 in the Code of Obligation. And this article says that um, liability of, uh, for unlawful intent that any agreement to exclude liability for unlawful intent or gross negligence is void. Okay, but we don't speak about exclusion of liability. We speak about limitation of liability. But the court said article 100 prohibits uh, the exclusion of liability. That means the liability may not be limited neither. Okay, here, is, here are further arguments that I can present to you, but I cannot comment them because I didn't manage really to understand them. Uh, and the court said, these arguments that the liability may not be limited does not contradict Article 447, Paragraph 3, that says that parties may agree on the limitation of liability if they wish. They said, no, no, that is not a contradiction. A contradiction would arise if one wanted to assume that this provision excluded the general rule of Article 100 on contractual liability, since in that case, the liability of the carrier would at the same time be more stringent and more stringent and easier. So that's, that would be a contradiction. So no, I, I just don't know what to say. That cannot be the meaning of Article 447, Paragraph 3. No, I don't know. Maybe they are thinking. <laughs> Sorry? They are thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they had a nice day at the court. And uh, so, okay, we shall see the arguments against this, uh, this argumentation later on. So in this case, the court was of the opinion that the uh, freight forwarder has to compensate the full uh, damage. Uh, another argument was another article of the Code of Obligation, Article 41, that says any person who unlawfully causes damage to another, whether willfully or negligently, is obliged to provide compensation. Okay, yes. But uh, that means whatever damage, a carrier has always to provide the full compensation. Okay, no, no other um, um, agreements with the carrier, no exclusions, no nothing. This is the rule, if that has to be applied always in all cases. 
Okay. It seems convincing, both Article 41 and the Article 100, at the first glance. They seem convincing. Yes, that is the rule, that is okay. But then, when you think a little bit more of it and put it in the context of carriage of goods and so, it, it doesn't function. On the other hand, arguments in favor of a limited liability for gross negligence. There are also some. Uh, in the old version of the Code of Obligations of 1881, there was a provision that was deleted in the, in the revision of 1911, and that provision allow, was allowing claim for further damages when gross negligence was proven. So it was expressly making carrier liable for further damages in cases when he was grossly negligent. And this provision was deleted without any replacement. That means that the legislator changed his idea. Then uh, these both provisions that I was mentioning, Article 49 and Article 100, they are in the general part of the Code of Obligations. And the Article 447 and 448, they are in the special part that concerns carriage of goods. So they are to be considered like specialis in any case. And in this Title 16, whenever the legislator wanted to have unlimited liability, like for example, in Article 454 on the prescription of actions of damages, he explicitly inserted such a provision saying um, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, prescription is in one year, so the claims for from arising from damage to the goods against the carrier uh, are time barred uh, in one year, except cases of gross negligence and intent. But in Article 447, it doesn't say the carrier is liable up to the value of the goods, the cases of uh, gross negligence and intent are exempted. We don't have that provision there. Of course, uh, in cases of intention, there are other provisions. So, uh, according to which the carrier's liability in cases of intent remains uh, illimited, unlimited but not in cases of gross negligence. So in any way, uh, the way that Title 16 regulates the carriage of goods and the liability of the carrier should be seen as like specialis and it doesn't matter so much what the provisions of the general part say in this particular case. Uh, as I already said, Article 100 says that the gross negligence should not be excluded. Such a, an agreement is null and void, but it doesn't say whether such liability may be uh, limited. And moreover, in the general part, this provision uh, relates to the contractual liability, because that is the part on the contracts. And Article 447, that is the statutory liability. The fact that the Article 100 talks about exclusion of liability and not the limitation was taken as a lacuna. Not that the legislator didn't want to regulate it, but he probably forgot or whatever. So this lacuna had to be filled with an analogy. If it may not be uh, excluded, okay, per analogy, it may not be limited neither. 
So this is this is not the right way because that is not the lacuna. There are also some other arguments. Uh, for example, uh, according to Article 41, if we accept this argument that anybody who causes a damage has to provide compensation, then that would also be in the cases of slight negligence. So no, no uh, limitation of liability would apply neither. So this argument is of no value neither. In practice, as I said, as that is the way that I was working all these days, the traditional opinion is that the carrier's liability for gross negligence cannot be limited. It is so. Everybody knows that it is so. Arguments or no arguments, that was the praxis. And I must say that also somehow corresponded to my feeling uh, gross negligence is really gross negligence. So why to allow the carrier a limitation when he acted in such a way that is not okay. So well, my if, feeling was, yeah. If you want to make a place of English law, the, the, they don't have a gross negligence, they can make it. Yeah. For the purposes of what we're discussing here, they, they understand what gross negligence is. But uh, you can't limit the liability for gross negligence or for this contact. You can't exclude, you can't limit. Mm -hmm. so yep. If you want to make a parallel, it should be the same thing. Yep. The limited liability is always a privilege. So, so mm -hmm. big acting. You know? Yeah, gross one part of the contract. Yeah, it's obvious so that it is not such a privilege. One part of the contract may agree that the other can limit its liability. But it will be always understood, providing there is no respect or for willful misconduct on the other side. Yeah. If there is, forget the limitation. Yeah. The yeah. court yeah. will recognize. Exactly, exactly. That is the way I understood it, and this is the way the insurers generally understood it. And on the basis of this non-limited liability, they constructed the insurance conditions and so on. But when you really look at the arguments of the code of conduct, then whether you like the result or not, I am now convinced that this legal analysis shows that the liability remains limited even in cases of gross negligence. Despite my feeling, despite my practice, yeah, uh, uh, I think even the international uh, convention, even in our American conventions, the level required is the intent to yeah. remove the right to it. We shall, we shall come to that, to that now. So that is the situation in practice, uh, there are some different uh, court decisions of the lower court. This only decision that with gold watches from the year 1976 concerned a contract of freight forwarding. The freight forwarder is also liable as carrier, but that was then on the basis of contract and not on the basis of 447 directly. Uh, so in fact, the federal Supreme Court has not yet, has not yet decided on the carrier's liability based on 447. <coughs> uh, some lower courts did make such a decision that gross negligence is not considered as equivalent to willful misconduct. We shall come to the CMR convention, convention right now. That is why this question is so important because in this case, 
the carrier may have acted recklessly, but this element of forethought was missing. In another case, the first instance was of the same opinion, but that was repealed by the court of the second instance. Then another court confirmed again that liability for gross negligence was unlimited. Unfortunately, this decisions, these situations did not reach the federal Supreme Court. Maybe the guys would be in another mood and <laughs> bring another decision. So why is that also of such importance? Uh, because of the question of equating gross negligence with willful misconduct for the purposes of the CMR convention. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, uh, the liability according to CMR is not limited if the carrier caused the damage uh, by willful misconduct or such default on its part as is equivalent to willful misconduct accordance with the law of the court or tribunal charged with the case. So the law of the tribunal is what matters. So in Switzerland up to now, mostly it is considered that gross negligence equals to willful misconduct for this purpose. For this purpose. For, for the same market. Yeah. Although it does not contain this element of intent. In other countries, I just brought a short overview. The general trend is that it is differentiated between negligence and this element of intent that willful misconduct contains. You think there is intent in willful misconduct? Yes, for example, in the German legislation, I know that for sure they departed from gross negligence and they require willful misconduct. And I also found that in some other. Which includes intent. Contingent intent. Intent of the. I would say it would be an intentional act or or he should have act, known, but he should have but known. Although there is no intent of causing damage, but it is an intentional it's careless. behavior. Yeah. It's careless. He's not knowing that it could cause damage. Although you don't want to cause damage, but so exactly that's exactly it's it is not direct intent he is going to yeah. damage the yeah. thing yeah. right okay. now, but he behaves in a way that damage he should have known, he should have realized. Carelessness. Exactly. He knows he should expect the damage to occur, but he doesn't care. Exactly. That's willful misconduct. Exactly. That is willful misconduct, and that is more than just gross negligence. Yes, yes. Um, as I said, the insurers in Switzerland, they, for them, it was also clear that the limit that the liability of carriers for gross negligence is not limited. So that's how they uh, drafted the <coughs> general conditions. And I talk about general conditions that are drafted by the Swiss Insurance Association because they are most spread on the market. Of course, insurers and the brokers may have their own uh, conditions and they may. Uh, regulate the, the insurance coverage as they wish, but in these general conditions of uh, the Swiss Insurance Association, <coughs> uh, uh, they assume uh, that the liability of the carrier that they ensure in cases of gross negligence is not limited. Um, These um, uh, conditions apply mostly to, to road transportation because, uh, uh, but also in, on combined transport and, uh, and so on. Uh, 
the conditions say that uh, if damage uh, is caused with a higher degree of liability uh, in, by intent, then there is no insurance coverage. But if the carrier caused the damage by gross negligence, then uh, the insurer is entitled to reduce its performance in proportion to the degree of the fault. So he doesn't say you, you carrier cause the damage with gross negligence, your liability is limited, I treat that as normal negligence, I pay up to the full value of the goods and that's it. Now, the insurers know that carriers are liable also for consequential loss for uh, higher uh, amounts than just the value of the goods. So they do insure these higher amounts, but they are allowed to reduce the performance. And that is, that is very tricky in How practice. Does that? How does that? That is tricky. The insurer has to assess, was that, a, okay, it was gross negligence, but was it just a slight gross negligence, you know? Or was it really gross negligence? But these reductions are 10%, maybe 20% if, if, if it was really, really a bad, a bad case. Mm -hmm. So in fact, liability for gross negligence is insured. We had cases where a carrier, he was having trucks uh, with the crane on the truck. Mm -hmm. So he was carrying a machine. He put the machine on the truck and then he forgot to lower the crane. So he hit a bridge mm -hmm. and the, the, the truck, the, the crane, the machine, everything was so mm -hmm. okay. It happened once. <laughs> and then after six months, okay. the same carrier, maybe the other driver, the other, another truck, but of the same type, he again hit a bridge somewhere. So I should remove the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Low flying bridges on, on its way. And then finally we said, look, I mean, no, what the company to remove bridges. <laughs> so first time maybe it is okay, it is grossly negligent, but but second or third time, look. <laughs> Okay, I think I gave you an overview of the situation that is obvious, but not really regulated in a proper legal way. So it may be, it may be, it may turn in another way in future. Uh, as I said, there is only one decision of the Supreme Court in this area, but it confirmed unlimited liability arising of a breach of contract and not uh, a breach of a statutory liability. If the federal Supreme Court once approves these arguments that I find legally well-founded. This will change the questions. The whole scenery of liability of the carrier in Switzerland will be shaken and, and reorganized. And I think it is just a question of time when such a case will arrive up to the Federal Supreme Court. And I am very, very curious Looking forward to see what the big guys are going to decide in this case. Thank you so much for your attention.